Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought um, I would read something here uh, today that uh, uh, can't be sold uh, and can't be published. Uh, it's, it's called The Manifesto of the Provisional Avant-Garde. So it's a kind of long poem. Uh, but before I read it, I have a small epigraph which comes from the third volume of the Sanhedrin Tractate of the Talmud. And uh, this is the translation of that uh, little section of the, of, the, of the Talmud. These are the signs that the Messiah is coming. When you see a generation that is dwindling, expect the Messiah. When you see a generation upon which numerous troubles come like a river, expect the Messiah. Troubles and harsh decrees will be constantly appearing anew. Before the first trouble is over, a second will hasten to appear. If you see a generation in which the number of scholars has decreased, expect the Messiah. The places of study will be emptied of scholars and serve as brothels. Corruption will have become so rampant that those few who remain truthful will have to band together and leave the general society. As for the rest of the people, their eyes will become worn out from grief and anxiety. This is the result of a long time yearning that ends in frustration. The face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Truth will be formed into groups and go away. During those years, there will be wars of Gog and Magog. And the uh, Hebrew scholar Yad Rama, when he read this in the Talmud, <coughs> said, I am in wonderment. According to these signs, why has the Messiah not come to this present generation of ours? And he wrote that in the 12th century. <laughs> <laughs> so... Manifesto of the Provisional Avant-Garde. The Provisional Avant-Garde is currently accepting resignations. The Provisional Avant-Garde is provision. The Provisional Avant-Garde is a little machine beside the tracks. The Provisional Avant-Garde decrees null and void all awards bestowed by the Governor General of Canada until further notice. <laughs> The provisional avant-garde will occasionally enter the academy to use the washrooms. The provisional avant-garde unclenches the map. Who was that small, brown-haired boy in short pants? The provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde writes on rather than about the city. Those cows are clouds on the plateau. They are the provisional avant-garde. If it looks like the avant-garde, it's not the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde will have its cake and eat it again and again. The provisional avant-garde is not a system of pointing. The provisional avant-garde will not dig deeper. The provisional avant-garde will not shake the hand that feeds it. The provisional avant-garde is neither clever, nor ironic, nor warm-hearted. The small black squirrel that leapt from the tree branch to the roof is the provisional avant-garde. Or no, it's not the small black squirrel, but the leaping of the small black squirrel from the tree branch to the roof that is the provisional avant-garde. Or rather, the event of that small black squirrel leaping from the tree branch to the roof is the provisional avant-garde. Or... The event of the leaping and my presence and implication in the squirrel's leaping is the provisional avant-garde. Or this sentence, its leaping and gazing, roofing and squirreling, is provisionally the provisional avant-garde. <laughs> the provisional avant-garde hates poetry. The provisional avant-garde hates fiction. The provisional avant-garde hates creative non-fiction. <laughs> the provisional avant-garde hates drama. The provisional avant-garde will do -si do The provisional avant-garde will pause now to get the fuck out of Afghanistan. I mean Libya, or Syria, then Pakistan, then Iran, then China. 
The provisional avant-garde is environmentally friendly. It will continuously recycle the same characters and plots. The provisional avant-garde discounts prizes, contests, literary magazines, journals, blogs, mainstream small and micro presses. The provisional avant-garde repudiates readings, open mics, slams, spoken word, creative writing workshops, and cocktail parties. The provisional avant-garde washes its hands of museums, private and artist-run galleries, private commissions, and public art. The provisional avant-garde will drink and sleep sous les ponts. The provisional avant-garde is a limited time offer. The value of the provisional avant-garde is 574. The provisional avant-garde is a continual permutation of letters. The continual continual of provisional is a a letters guard avant permutation. The provisional avant-garde concedes that writing is not enough. The provisional avant-garde is incomplete. What web tales will emerge from those tailings ponds? The provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde guarantees a high return on your investment. The provisional avant-garde declares from time to time. The provisional avant-garde occurs between the hours. The provisional avant-garde is neither haunted nor haunting. The provisional avant-garde makes dolorous sense. Sorry, that's dollars and cents. The provisional avant-garde lowers the flag. Those goats who were so bad on the road to Mohakar, they were the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde preoccupied Wall Street. The provisional avant-garde shot Kenny Goldsmith. (laughs) The old man sweeping outside the temple was the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde declares a unilateral truce. The provisional avant-garde is not a tool for marketing poetry. The provisional avant-garde wears pigtails. The provisional avant-garde is no man's land. The provisional avant-garde is mild and gentle and good, good tasting. The time of the avant-garde is already past. The time of the provisional avant-garde is always yet to come. The provisional avant-garde is that fishing line down the length of which we deliver ourselves into the water. Smoke the provisional avant-garde, the avant-garde of good taste. The provisional avant-garde recalls the troops. The provisional avant-garde unwraps and rewraps its bandages one by one rather than all at once in case it should be urgently needed. The provisional avant-garde draws a breath before writing. The provisional avant-garde is peer-reviewed. The provisional avant-garde is an asymmetrical lyric. The provisional avant-garde is ambient sound. The provisional avant-garde will not attend this reading, nor will it go for a drink after the reading. I have resigned from the provisional (laughs) avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde seeks not to destroy language, but merely to hurt it a little. Every morning in that cafe in Bucharest, Elisa Sampedrin begins her day by taking up her pen to compose her resignation from the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde brings the war home. The provisional avant-garde calls for a general strike of all poets to test the proposition that no nation can survive without poetry. The provisional avant-garde travels without a passport. The provisional avant-garde dismantles the barricades upon which it stands. The provisional avant-garde is neither postage stamp nor postcard. The provisional avant-garde is not a language tourist. The provisional avant-garde puts boots on the ground. Those extremophile bacteria were already singing. They have always been singing. We might hear their songs if we stopped for a moment, drowning them out with our poems. Those bacteria, their singing, they are the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde melts in your hand, not in your mouth. The provisional avant-garde will drop a small stone in the ballot box. 
The provisional avant-garde demands free and fair insurrections. The provisional avant-garde abandons all sense of proportion. The provisional avant-garde adopts a total lack of perspective. The provisional avant-garde, here today, gone tomorrow. Although the provisional avant-garde was unarmed, it appeared to be resisting. We shot it twice in the face. This is a robocall from the provisional avant-garde. <laughs> Every second of time is the straight gate through which the provisional avant-garde might enter. www. the provisional avant-garde. The provisional avant-garde prefers not to. Those early figs in the orchard by the gate, they are the provisional avant-garde. Thank you. <laughs> Before Erin reads from her new book, um, we thought we'd read a little bit from the work we're doing together now um, on a book by Nicole Brossard called Piano Blanc, a book of poems. Uh, so we're still working on this uh, book, and uh, we thought we'd just test it out a little bit and see what some of it sounds like. So if you'll bear with us, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a few pages of it. And, uh, yeah. So I start in French. Well, I, I was just going to say, too, that we are we actually have lots of time. We're still working on it because we have lots of time. It's going to be published by Coach House next spring, so in a, a year from now. So we're, uh, we're taking our time on it. So I think we're going to start with a piece called... So, we're, yeah, we're at the beginning here. Mm. Tressailli. Or Quivering. C'est un mercredi tranquille, personne ne se révolte, la lumière gagne le corps, roule autour des poignets, ténèbres en garde à vue. It's a quiet Wednesday, no one clamors. Light reaches the body, coils round the wrists, darkness held under suspicion. On parle tout bas, de glisser vers l'abîme, défiguré loin de l'humanité. We talk in low murmurs of slipping toward the brink, disfigured, far from humanity. Au matin, j'ai un chiffre dans le sentiment, un œil de première personne au pluriel, moi d'ensemble et des mois nourris, de règne animal et d'azur. In the morning, my feelings have a number, an eye of second person plural, me commingled in emotion nourished by animal kingdom and by azur. Voici que tu surveilles les virgules qui effacent et refont la nuit. Voici que le moment venu tu caresses une nappe d'eau et sa logique d'embrasement. So you keep watch for the commas that erase and raise the night. So when the time's right, you caress a sheet of water and its emblazing logic. Je dis ce qu'on dit de ne pas mentir. C'est infiniment risqué. I say what is said about not telling lies. It's infinitely chancy, and we breathe. Langue, je dirais oui, du haut de ma cage thoracique. Langue, viens-tu, dehors, déniché, le sel, la certitude. Language, I'll say yes, from the top of my ribcage. Language, will you come out and dig up the salt, the certitude. Okay. Oh, no. We have so many copies. I'm always mixed up, so it's better to hand me the right picture. L'usage des vertiges minuscules. Qui voudra encore s'entêter de réel, balbutier dans le répertoire des armes et des boucles en série d'autrui? Debout, notre corps n'en pense pas moins. La mer, la faim, la manœuvre mystérieuse de l'air, de ces bons fabuleux dans la poitrine, à bonne vitesse d'ombre, sortir de soi exige de filer doux entre siècles et galaxies, marelles célestes. Notre mythologie de nuit millénaire 
quelques noms de bêtes au cœur arraché, la transparence fruitée de nos sexes, tout ça sort de soi vivant, trop bref. The use of tiny vertigos. Whoever still wants to hang on to the real, to stammer in the repertoire of guns and the serial loops of others, upright our body doesn't think any less. Sea, hunger, the mysterious maneuver of air and its fabulous bounds in the chest at the speed of shadow. To break free of the self just told the line between centuries and galaxies, celestial hopscotch. Our mythology of millennial night, a few names of beasts with hearts ripped out, fruity transparency of our sexes. It all breaks free of the self, alive to grief. <laughs> this is the unmentionable. I'll, I'll just, I just want to start by saying... Um, I'll read you the back cover. I wrote the front cover and the back cover, but um, the the image on the cover is from a from a performance installation work by the Montreal artist, now Newfoundland artist, uh, Vita Simon. And these are two of her singing jars. And then this uh, this performance was done in in Czechoslovakia, in the Czech Republic, in a small town. I could find it. I could tell you what it was. Um, in an art center that's in a, a former synagogue. Um, Writing's too small. Okay. Oh yes, it was called Preserves the, uh, the the actual work, and it was at the at home gallery in Shamorin in Slovakia, actually not in the Czech Republic. So, anyway, she made these to accompany a, a performance that she did with a huge paper mache grandmother, who that she had made that's about twenty feet tall, like most grandmothers. <laughs> um, these jars are just preserved jars. They have a hole in them, punched in them with a nail, and uh, um, what do you call it? Wool, a ball of, of wool or thread in them. And in fact, they're they're like jars. They're silent until someone pulls the string, and then the jars actually make a singing noise. They turn into instruments, and the singing noise changes, of course, as there you unravel the yarn and there's let more air and less yarn the sound changes and the each member of the public during the installation was given one of these and they acted as the orchestra they just pulled out the string so it's quite uh, it just seemed to be a a good uh, kind of, of, of visually symbolic of the book itself so the, the back of the book just to, to not give a long explanation is um, in crossing borders of culture and memory, there is an unmentionable spacing. So E.S., Elisa of Little Theatres and Ores Blandor, sits in a flat on M.V. Street in Bucharest, preparing to resign from the position of the card. <laughs> E.M. arrives in another part of the Romania capital, not from Canada, but from burying her mother's ashes in Ukraine, in the village where her maternal family, her mother's maternal family, or her mother's family, my, my maternal family, was erased by war and time. But ES was also in Ukraine. There, watching EM through the trees in a downpour, an idea came to her. She would use EM to research the nature of experience. And my cover blurbs are from Plato and Giorgio Agamben. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually just two quotes that also have to do with the book. <clears throat> that I'm just going to read the Giorgio Agamben quote. It's from a book of his that was translated into French as L'idée de l'énigme. And my book could probably be called, instead of the idea of the enigma, it could be called the enigma of the idea. Anyways, uh, Agamben uh, wrote, or his French translator wrote, Seule est vraie la représentation qui représente aussi l'écart entre elle-même et la vérité. So the only true representation also represents the gap between itself and the truth. So I'll just give a little jumpy reading um, in here. Everyone comes from somewhere, Mom. No, Donetsko, not everyone. Some people come from nowhere. You came with a passport, Mati, long before. You came from somewhere. When there was no one left, it became nowhere. There were no more letters after the... Wh when they find the child up the hill and bring her home frightened of bears.
So I'll read a section. Elisa Sanhedrin writes several of the sections in the book, and um, I'll, I'll read a little bit from one of those sections. I've decided to take EM for my experimental subject. She's here and she's a pest. She might as well serve some useful purpose. And she has an inner forum and recalls an infancy, an infans before speaking. As for me, I am better off without other either. Yes has no inner forum or inner sanctum because she's invented. EM in the trees and rain of Veliki Tlibovici with the promise making her both light and heavy. One of the last things I can do that my living mother wanted to return her to the soil in Ukraine where she was born. Testifying to the endurance of desire beyond any possibility of experience. The transfer of desire between bodies. Is this the beyond of experience? <clears throat> the beyond of borders? Experience of she? A breach or symptom? If experience requires entry into language, then we cannot experience death. For language ceases. There is no remnant. Or there is. By taking her notebook, I make myself responsible. I myself become the restitution she is searching for. But I desert her. I left her a new notebook, and I'll fill hers on my own. So that's a Felicia. She can't even buy her own notebooks. There's several poems in this book. Um, and they're, they're all written by Lisa Sampedrin because, as we know, E.M. cannot write poetry. And they're all written in Bucharest. Uh, they have name, strange names, Haliutika. If you Google their names, you'll find out that Elisa's, all the titles of Elisa's poems are named with the titles of the works of the Roman poet Ovid. So this is Haliutika. I am a thinking, conscious thing that is a being who doubts. I am certain that I am a thinking thing in a manner or way of thinking. For when I think that a stone is a substance, although I conceive that I am a thinking <coughs> and non-extended thing, merely in respect of our mode of thinking, since I am merely a thinking thing, since I am a thinking thing and possess in myself an idea of God, it is likewise a thinking being, insofar as I am a thinking being. I think it proper to remain here for some time in contemplation. The other disrupts the I think, thus breaks with intentionality. Knowing anything requires this breaking, a movement toward the exterior. Is EM my exterior? <clears throat> I see her again in the museum cafe this time, fumbling a pen and glass. In her bag, that same spoon, I saw her use to dig the earth at Great Klibovici, Veliki Klibovici. She buried something there outside herself space and time anachronic. Was it her way of making knowledge possible? To know anything, time must go backward. Look at her fumbling. What is her relation to experience now? But of course she is experience, even as she is not fully captured by what she is thinking. Boreal forest in the north edge of Aspen Parkland. Why did I write this just now? The scythes. And then she proceeds, Elisa Sanpedrin, who's writing in Bucharest, proceeds to write about Alberta. She writes things like Aspen on the steep slope south and west with balsam poplar at small creek drainages, a few stands of mature white spruce on the hilltop plateau, along drainages on the north slope, birch rise over alder, alder willow shrubland mixed with foothill shrubs, mountain ash and thimbleberry. Windbreak of green ash and laurel willow on the north of the field. Dozens of spruce at the south perimeter. It is a more moderate climate, apart from the impassable roads and wind. Father and mother. We had 23 crows and three ponies. Due north of Huellen, Alberta. Riding in the black moleskin. Northwest 14, 72, 9, west 6. My intention was just to write at the desk in Bucharest, but this notebook paper turns into a plant again, damp with sap and fiber and breaks the nib. Perfumes anarchic tendency and away with words, fallen down on crested birds. The smell of hay and the look of God, the pen writes. We wept our gifts for you, dear mother, our treasures, waking up in the night and wringing out the shirt. Even then the tumor was growing in the blood. 
Tomas' shadow bent long from the doorway to the forest, but it's just the noise of darkness and the gate banging shut in wind. This notebook is a resting sleep, lying face down in a pool of snow. When I look up, a siren and the light of the ambulance flashes off the walls as it streaks down Mate Voivod in the dark. But who does it carry? And repeatedly, E.M.? Is she eating the peanut again? <laughs> Out the window, I see not Mate Voivod in Bucharest, but the grand prairie of the South Peace, west toward the raised shelf of the mountain, never covered by the sheet of ice, they say. There the shut birches turn their buds to light the sky. I turn back to my room only when the clouds have rolled in and the mountain itself is obscured by May snow. Here's the view obscured by May snow. <laughs> Explore looking. Let's see if I can go back to. Hmm. This is E.M. Home, the barbaric language. I wade through the stream of grasses. <clears throat> My mother's sweater clings to their seeds. I bow down to soil and streaming grasses, lights hedge and memory. I see her wading in those grasses outside memory, inside soil. Her frail membrane touches. What it touches, hillside touches, disappears. E.M., daughter of M. Grendish, daughter of A. Homoviak. To enfant book and word, the word that can be lost and burned, the word that cannot, shibboleth, the very birth of language. A row of houses leads to the Davidivka River. Those were the Polish houses. No, not these. These are new. They burned those Polish houses and drove them away. Who this them was, this they, this they them. Rain, silence of rain. We walk behind the woman who is not speaking. Now they wish they would come back again. A pronoun problem, a time problem, a village silence. In fans. In the fields where people were once murdered on the basis of an accent, by asking locals the names for food, pierogi or pierogi, they knew which language led at home, which is to say, at the kitchen table. To say the name of food one way equals the historical enemies of the scratch people. Yet there was another name for the people of this place, Tuteshni, 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 the ones who lived here, local. Torch the homes, they won't come back here, but vanish as I does. Torch the homes, cut out the tongue, excise the barbaric accent. South Africa, Galicia, Dominican Republic, southeast of Lviv, panic, pandemonium, peine, bright, chlep, clip, bread. Don't leave a single fruit tree standing. At night, the children were harvested with flames, the building spontaneously combusted. How did it burn down, we asked the woman, standing at the empty grove, rain pasting our clothes flat. It was made of wood she said. She calls it not X but Y, the word from the other tongue that is this tongue too, a village tongue, a word from the expelled language. The infiltrations are lexical, silence, blood, air, spear tout, trout with sticks of white grass, larvae. Marked by that foreign word, marked too, by imperial consequence in time, peeled from the mud of labor, sorrow too, harvested of vowels for trout. Dad, Tato came in and whispered to me to say forever after, Ukrainian mom, Matinka, mama, Mati. They came down the road at night and pitted us against our brothers, so as not to be killed. Trout lay in the shadow of trees, breathing in shallow water. After supper, the families are back in the fields with hand implements and bicycles, making use of the light. Perhaps it is better, says E.M., if Elisa Sampedrin writes of these things. She, Galician, not of Halicina or of the Cray or Cressy, not of the Verges, but of Brigantium Flavium, Rua dos Judeos, who gets off the train from Bucharest at Veliki Klibovici to find Erin Mori, burying the ashes of her mother in the grove where once a Latin church stood. 
E.S. bows her head, of course. Ashes are going to the ground again. Opening the earth is not always a crime. That a mother was born in Poland because of the magnates and a league of nations with a Polish name, Polish name or perhaps Ukrainian, yet speaking the languages of the village, local for centuries, from here to Teshny. In those years, a name was an enemy, an accent in a word was an enemy, an alphabetic spire of ink in a ledger was an enemy. I come from nowhere, she'd say to the small EM. Some people come from nowhere. And <clears throat> sort of unfortunately, censure has cut history up. A wide experience by degrees fat sapped the faith reposed in my senses. Silence at barbarity Mars kills our souls in installments. The wreck of culture, daughters observe brothers die into great pain. At first, language was cut off. Closer, it pulled out eyes. There, hope could not know we. It is possible that all that coincides in the body are merely chimerae. In the passport photo, the child unstable signifier defiant in the father's arms, thick hand stares outlive. C'est sans doute là où la pensée se trouve. Monster dozing in a person arises in extreme condition. Poetry and begins ravening. Faces remember people's names. Fear witness what they. Cough smoke from houses this old church. Murdering, struggling, lasted repeated hours. That they survived, save miracle. Humiliation does not justify blood to trail out of skin. Horse reared up in my village. No one humiliated nobody into my village. Different nations lived in agreement by centuries, ages. But later, part of my village completely crumbled. Gone my other Polish local. Great fragment fallen to abyss and trees for tumulos cut down. Pears, apples, forest birches. Therein lies the profound correspondence between the being and the thought. Insert a map of culture here. Je suis moi-même une machine à écrire. Ukrainian, said my mother. Polish, said my uncle, older. But mom is Ukrainian, she insisted. Polish was what they taught in school. Austrian, says my grandfather, <laughs> gazing out at the soldier's road. In secret on the mountain, I tried to read the letters, for my parents worried awake at night with what they told. But one alphabet I could not read. They did not teach it in Canadian school. This morning, when I wake up from my dream of cabbage, I, the am, open my notebook and my notes have vanished. It looks like my notebook, a black moleskin bent down at the corner with a page saved from 24 fun in the back pocket, the Bucharest theater schedule from August 1st. It's top crunched. But my notes are gone. Where once there were pages filled with my musings on the infinite, there's only this, quote, There is a phantasmal poetry and a poetry of the seeing self. There is a miniaturized poetry and an aggrandizing poetry. And there is the poetry that does not want to be found. Stop desiring me. I have nothing to reveal. My withdrawal leaves no hole in the panorama. Close quote. E.S. to E.M. Bucharest, August 12th. This is crossed out and there is added in a hand not unlike E.S.'s. Je vous avise de brûler la mémoire des cartes et de penser pour vous-même. I advise you to burn the memory of the letters and to think for yourself. And so on. I think it's an attitude towards towards writing that that she's she's talking about it there, and that I I think fits. I, it's interesting that you. Because when I, I read that passage, uh, of which I've been reading, I've been reading this book <laughs> over the last week, um, and interrupting my classes <laughs> with it. So, um, and I, I thought, yes, it reminded me of um, this character named uh, Rabbi Nauman, right? Uh, who who wrote a book which is called the Burnt Book, and he was a he was a scholar in the 17th century, uh, uh, a Talmudic scholar and and um, supposedly the most learned teacher um, 
but he never wrote anything down. It was all oral teaching. And he, he, he got very old, and his students gathered around him and said, you're going to die soon. Please write down everything you know. All this knowledge will be lost. And uh, so he, he said, no, no, I, I will not write down what I know. And they, they kept begging him to do it. Finally, he said, all right, I will do it. And he went off, and he wrote this huge book um, and then gathered all his students around him and sat down, showed them the book, and burned it in front of them. And he said, uh, after me, there shall be no school. Which is sort of what Aaron is saying, which says, you know, think for yourself. Uh, as the, you know, what the poet poem is supposed to do, uh, rather than, you know, win over someone to another avant-garde or another school, right? And I don't know if that's something that that is new, and you can say if it's new in your work. I, th I think it's been there for a long time in, in Aaron's work, um, and it's one of the things that makes... You have to go and find Aaron's work, <laughs> uh, you know, compared to some other work that is you know, constantly being thrown at you. Um, and that makes it you know, uh, more worthwhile in many ways for you because you, it requires work. It requires, and it doesn't beg to be, um, to be read, understood, and you know, digested in that sense. I don't know. If There's also, I mean, just what you were saying about the burning of the, the writing too is that um, one, one of the one of the things that's a problem with writing is that if we record everything, that those records can be burnt. So when the invading people come through, they can burn the records. And if you, it's like there's, there's one piece I was trying to summarize it in the middle of this little bit of poem here. Is it, and the summary is that relationships written down instead of remembered cuts the tie. When the register burns, so does memory, as this was passed to writing, and the content of a writing burned can no longer be handed back to memory, for writing abolishes memory, and as what was written can no longer be passed down, it has no author in the old sense, no ability to act as proxy to, to verify on behalf of. And the, in this case, Anastasia and Thomas authors vanish. That, um, which was a thing I... Uh, that I've heard talking to people who, uh, whose cultures have been primarily oral quite late on, saying that when you make a deal, that's why like a handshake or making an agreement verbally is more reliable than, than writing something down. Because as soon as something is written down, it's, even if it doesn't get burnt, it's, it's fixed. But wor the world and life move on. They flow past it. And then when you start to look at this thing that's written down, it doesn't cover everything. It doesn't, you know, and I mean, that's why we have, like, a huge contract law. As soon as you write down a contract and sign it, then there's trouble. You know, whereas, whereas living people who've agreed to do something, as the flow of life goes on, they adjust, they, they can adjust their agreement and, and their understanding because all they've done is shake to say that they're going to agree so that from then on they have to make these little adjustments so that they can, um, they can keep agreeing, or else they have to bring it to a tr tribunal who will listen to them, who doesn't take written arguments, who will, you know, of the people in their community who will listen to them and decide, and help them decide how they can refix their oral agreement. So it's sort of, it's sort of interesting, our, our reliance on writing sometimes, it, it's too noisy, <laughs> and, it's, and it fixes things that, uh, in a way that that um, an oral thing doesn't, an oral thing is flexible. If you've ever tried to study Plato on your own with no help, it's like pretty hard. Like you really, it's really beneficial to, uh, to study Plato with another group, with a group of people studying Plato with somebody who has studied a lot of Plato, i.e. a teacher. <laughs> um, and being allowed to, but being art allowed to articulate things and then have those cancelled out by somebody else articulating and that kind of movement of thought, that is thought. I mean, the dialogues are kind of an important thing and they've stayed important because they keep stimulating these kind of discussions. If they didn't, then we would have forgotten about Plato a long time ago. And any kind of written work that doesn't keep stimulating 
people to think again and to speak again and to speak with people who might think differently about it is is in the end not going to last very long you know it's it's like it's the, so the writing is important but on the other hand not not just in and of itself it's that that is not won't endure to me you know but it's, in, it's interesting too I also there's also stolen a lot from um, Lisa San Pedrin steals a lot from Descartes too I mean I think also the the um What's the pharmacon is both a poison and a remedy, right? Mm-hmm. So writing is both poison and a remedy. So Plato isn't saying, you know, that writing is bad. He's saying writing is both bad and is a re- is a remedy. So it's a paradox, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's how I look at writing. I mean, that's why those translations in, from the Chinese are in eighty-five letters, right? Because this definition, what is the definition of a book, is uh, according to the <laughs> to the Talmud, eighty five letters and constantly in movement. Why? Because well, if you look at the at the law of laws, the writing, the first writing, which which are the Ten Commandments, and Moses comes down with them. And what's the first thing he does with the Ten Commandments? He shatters them into into fragments. And not because he's just because he's angry because they're 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 worshiping golden idols, but because the law, the truth, the writing is shattered to begin with, always already shattered, and in fragments. And so your our job is constantly reassembling it and re reform forming the laws. We don't know the correct order of the of the letters in the in in the Bible. We don't know the rules. We have to make them up constantly. We have to constantly be reassembling them. Um, and and so that's whether it takes the form of burning or the form of shattering, that to me is what the poet does. Uh, the poet, you know, throws the poem down on the ground and then picks it up, you know, and, and in that sense. So it's, a, it's paradoxical uh, because I'm sort of reluctant to say, oh, we have to go back to an oral uh, kind of way of, you know, there is, as you said, no returning. And mm-hmm. I don't think oral preceded writing anyway, but uh, that's another issue. But, but, but certainly we have to th- rethink the way we think of the text and the writing, yeah. and uh, uh, and as poets, I think, or writers, in, in any case, uh, that's what we do. I think we, as much, we, we tear down and erase and break, uh, as mu- and burn as much as we're, uh, as we're, you know, producing structures and and assembling things. If you think of what's the thing Derry does is if you're walking through the forest and you make a line you know in the in through the forest if you draw a line a path in the forest that's a form of writing right? so it's, it depends how we define writing so if we define writing as you know uh, a specific form of, of, of using ink or some form of liquid and, and putting it on paper that's a very limited sort of restricted idea of what writing is the same as if we define the book as being the codex with the cover, and then that's a very limited uh, definition of what a book is. So I, ar- I argue that those works that are up there, the tra- those poems, they're books. Each of them is a book. They're a sheet, and there are 85 letters in them, and they are a book because uh, they are in motion. The meaning is permutating and, and, and shifting. And... Uh, they are uh, letters, right? Um, and uh, I mean, the Canada Council may not agree that that constitutes a book. <laughs> they want a page count or something, right? Um, but I think that's that's. How I'm trying when I was working on this project, I was trying to reduce, like, what could be less. How how much could I take away and still be a book, right? In that sense, and writing, I think, is the same thing. So if I if I just you know do this. That's writing, <laughs> right? and that precedes oral. Uh, like that precedes me explaining. I am drawing a line. <laughs> it's, it precedes the act. You know, it's not a letter yet, but it's it's writing um, in that sense. And people, I mean, there's some people who have like their idea of writing is so different than ours. Like my my friend Pedro went to to the Amazon to um, 
to study poets of the Amazon. And so they were like, oh, like, you're a poet. Like, we'll have to introduce you to our, our local poets. And they're like, he's like, yeah, and he wanted to meet the local poets. And they're like, oh, like, where's your poem? You know, and he's like, oh, well, I've got this book. And they're like, oh, what's that? Like, they were, they were like, no, it's like, how do you, how do you arrange grasses? How do you arrange the grasses and, and uh, before you burn them, like for the, and he was like, oh, I, you better show me, like, because I don't know. And they, these, they had, they would say their poems, but they also had, like, the writing of the poems was contained in the way they made grass bundles. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's absolutely, this is primitive writing. Those grass bu- bundles contained a lot. And it got so that, like, Pedro came back and he was like a, a Peruvian uh, Baroque poet, you know, and he, and now he's, um, he's he went back to study with them in the in, to study with them in the Amazon in the forest and kind of left his degree program at UDM where he was supposed to be uh, writing something else. But um, it's kind of interesting when two kinds of writing comes face to face because we assume our writing is the best and that our writing con- counts for something. And then when you look at the way other people see writing. And it you, you made me think, too, of like in O City Dan, I have this thing where I'm talking about writing where it's like, is the first writing just like a leaf mark in stone? The, which is, in you know, even, even to say a leaf mark in stone, that could be something solid like a fossil. Mm-hmm. Or otherwise, if a leaf falls on a stone, what mark does it leave? You know, how can a leaf make a mark in a stone but to me I was when I look at things like that like I think like how could I write a poem as as good as like that this rock I found today where there's a bit of petrified wood stuck in it so that that, that it means that a tree fell on whatever material made this rock like these two totally different surfaces came together and they stuck together that long like I could never write a poem like that you know my poems are too limited. This is the first time I've actually read it without a mask on, <laughs> uh, or, or uh, in fact, being most. I've read it a few times with a mask on and on a screen in another city, uh, like through skyping it in. Or uh, the first time I produce. Oh, I, I mean, it changes constantly. But I, I started it on Twitter. So I would just send out one line on the Twitter and then another line. And, you know, gradually it was just, so it, it was like a manifesto on Twitter. Uh, and, yeah, so that is part of the provisionality of it, that uh, it, it, it remains virtual and, you know, uh, I mean, and I have, after I put it out there on, 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 on Twitter, I started getting people, you know, sending me emails Asking for advice, <laughs> and I said, you know, or what does the provisional avant-garde think about this idea? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I resigned. I, I resigned. <laughs> I, I was the second person to resign. Aaron resigned first. Actually, <laughs> the first Twitter that went out was, you know, the provisional avant-garde is now accepting resignations, and, and I resigned. immediately I got a, I had a response from Aaron. Saying, I resigned. <laughs> <laughs> so, <figures. Proof> <laughs> I think that these mediums, like virtual mediums, and these new technologies, offer us ways to rethink uh, w- what writing is in a lot of ways. I mean, I go back to my teaching, and I walk into, you know, we have creative writing courses still in our department that are divided: poetry, drama, nonfiction, fiction. And I, I, I just teach writing. I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't understand that division anymore. It really makes no sense. And I look at Aram's work, and in a sneaky sort of way, she's now writing novels, really, because this is like a really, this is a novel, <laughs> in a sense. But it's also a book of theory, and you know, it's also a po- a, a book of poems, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, if she were to remain in that kind of idea of. Well, I'm a poet. I'm, you know, follow these structures and these. Um, she wouldn't be writing this, or couldn't write it, right? And, and I think that's shifting. And the technologies are part of the reason why, but not just that. I think there are also other reasons why, um, why language is ch- shifting the way we we think about writing and the way we think about it. 
they won't pay us for most of what we write anyway. So that gives us huge freedom. <laughs> I was going to say too, like the idea that it's that it can't be published because it's also always in movement. It's changing. Like yeah. last time I heard him read this, the robocalls weren't in there. Mm-hmm. And so that by not publishing, it allows the it 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 doesn't have the effect of fixing or stopping the movement of the of the work, mm-hmm. and because of that, it it has the same it maintains its meaning because it can change. Like if it just sat there, it would gradually become more and more remote. And I mean, we notice this especially like translations, like like originals of work as time goes on, need more and more footnotes to make them understandable. And, or else we just, they, don't, they seem trivial to us. And whereas translations, we don't footnote them, we get it translated again. We get the book translated into the, the current idiom. And we say, oh, now we're not going to read that anymore. Like nobody reads Alexander Pope's translation of the Iliad anymore unless you're really doing a doctorate in... in Pope and the Iliad, or unless you're Peter Quartermain. <laughs> he woke up then. Pope! The Iliad. <laughs> but, you know, and, and every once in a while there's something like Beowulf keeps getting retranslated. Everything, like, things, like, translations kind of, they have a, you know, best before date. They're like yogurt. And <laughs> after a while, you can't really have them for breakfast anymore. <laughs> The self is what the self is because there's people around it and there's discussions around it and there's and there's you know speakings and echoes and reverberations possible. I mean, you could take the same person, the same set of DNA, and stick it, have it live for a long time in one place, and it, and then take the same set of DNA and have it live for a long time in one the other place, and they might have many things in common later, but they would have different cultures and different different ways of thinking about things. I just I don't think any one person can do the thinking that that we need uh, in our times. Partly because one person can't keep the language moving enough, in a sense. And um, I mean, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm not sure. I don't know. Like, like you know, what is politics in our time? For sure, it's not what politicians are doing. <laughs> you know, there's some kind of order and. Mm-hmm. And though that, I mean, that relationality is just important to me as an individual, uh, being in the world that I have some, I like reflecting, I like hearing what other people have to say. I like, that's one of the reasons I like poetry readings is more, I find more and more, I was just saying in Rita Tregobal's class this afternoon, that more and more there's interesting discussions after. I also think it's like a shift in, um, in, 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 from politics of identity, uh, you know, to 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 a kind of more uh, uh, dismantled self. It's like when when I say, you know, the, the provincial avant-garde dismantles the barricades on which it stands. So you know, this this is the difficulty, <laughs> uh, which is how do you you know um, how do you make politics when you you can't have fixed identities? It's a problem. And uh, the solution is not, a, there is no solution, but there is a kind of wrestling with that problem. And I think I would rather be recognizing the existence. So who I am changes. And, you know, because I've seen so many cases in my life of people organizing to fight for their rights <laughs> and ignoring the rights of others. So when somebody like, you know, Aaron goes over and sees what's going on in the Ukraine. I mean, aside from the connection of the mother, or you know, or 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 how you get there, when you get there, you you encounter something, and you you change your your, and science now they're saying our genes change, uh, mm-hmm. from experience. In other words, they're now recognizing that the brain cells and the genetic structure of your synapses and your and your brain actually change as you experience things. So this idea that, you know, we're one whole being and then it's acted on, but there's always still that little shell in the middle, it doesn't work, right? We, we're an intersection of <laughs> energies and forces and and yet we still have to, we still, politics still matters, I think. Yes, I agree with you. I think it does matter. And, and so we, we have to find a way <laughs> 
Um, and that's what we're struggling at doing. I don't have the answer. If I had the answer, I would be the avant garde. <laughs> you know, like, um, but you you make up, you make it up as you go. I think depending where you happen to be standing at any given time, surrounded by people, <laughs> and, and and that's tough. Uh, but that's that's all we have right now. I think. I never really kind of conceptualized it in terms of of my own work or the reader facing my work, except that I have lots of confidence in the reader. I mean, in the sense you could easily conceptualize it by saying, because Levinas says you have to approach the the stranger or the in their strangeness that you can't expect them to act like you act. And to me, that was always. I mean, I thought about that when I was uh, when I was write, writing Ossidan. Actually, that the that there's the the, 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 if the person acts in a way that you can predict and then you accept them, that's your na- that's a neighbor. But the relationship with the stranger that Levinas is talking about isn't that kind of relationship at all. It's, it's that you have to I- accept what that person does and, um, and, and, and let them be themselves in their strangeness instead of trying to change them into something that you can understand or something that's like you. And I think that I mean that there's a kind of strangeness I'm sure in the encounter with of the reader with my work, just as there is in in my writing it too, like me me figuring out how to write it, like it's continual trying to let let language be strange myself, but like I myself let language be strange and not try to to resolve it. You know, mm-hmm. I think these quizzical spaces that you can enter are far more interesting than the spaces of certainty. Also, I mean, I found in this book, I I was looking after reading um, Descartes. Again, I I was reading Levinas, and then all I could see in Levinas was him going, I think, I think, and like, blah, blah, <laughs> thinking, being, and thinking, being. I'm like, am I reading Descartes again? Like, I thought I was, this was Levinas, and I, I started taking out all these little phrases where people are using I think, or, think, or thinking about thinking, because um, they were... You put, when you take them out and then put them all together, they're they're kind of endlessly instructive. You know, like thinking is just a kind of busyness, really. Like, <laughs> anyway. when you guys collaborate together on translation, how do you do it? Uh, I don't know. We well, actually, tr- uh, collaborating with Robert on translation has been really useful to me because I realized that. That my and and with with Juana too. That my own writing actually takes place outside myself. Like there's, Bob and I. We used to have. We used to just. We decided that the person did the translation. We worked, and the person was responsible for the translation. We invented a translator. A person, yeah. A person, yeah. And then, but it helped us because when we would get stuck and we couldn't agree, we would say, "Well, what would the person say?" <laughs> Yeah. But we, technically, or more specifically, we what we'll do is we'll we'll each uh, take a section and uh, translate it underneath the line in as many versions as we can come up with, each of us. And so you could have like one line with twenty possible options under it and variations and. Uh, and that's like a first step in the process. It's a proliferation of voices. Hmm? It's a proliferation of voices. Yeah, yeah. And, and all we, these voices. And then there's tones, right? And for a while, it takes us a while to find the right tone for the work. And mm-hmm. just as, you know. Then we exchange them and we make them even longer. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. then, then the then second look, person thinks of even more <laughs> alternatives. And then we, we get on Skype now. We used to do it in person, but we get on Skype and we read it out loud. Like we read the original out loud and the other person looks at the, all the alternatives and then the other person comes up with a version and then the first person's like, no, that doesn't. And we work back and forth, back and forth with the original and this, and we get rid of some of the proliferations, which is hugely funny sometimes because some of the things don't work at all. And, <laughs> and they're, they're yeah, you hilarious. You stray very far. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It helps sometimes you stray very that. far, and by straying very far, though, you get yeah. back, you get to something yeah. you would never have got to otherwise. Mm-hmm. So we let ourselves stray and stray. And stray. Well, I think I agree with what Aaron said, that, uh, that it is like... I don't see a huge difference uh, between the two for me, right? 
I, I mean, because I'm not interested in uh, that interested in 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 uh, inventing new stories and new characters or things like that. I'm more interested in the language and what's happening, what it invents, and what. It, so I have this sense that I'm already encountering something that exists before me, and I'm translating it, right? And like Aaron says, often I look at my work and I say, "This is, you know, it is another in, in a lot of ways." So I, I think, I mean, I don't think I could translate uh, collaboratively with anyone. I think there's still something because with Aaron, I know when we get it, we both know <laughs> somehow. Like you know, yeah. we'll say, "Yes, that's it," and it doesn't matter which one of us. Thought and we get it. we get rid of each other's excesses too, because yeah. like you're, I mean, transition comes through normally one one apparatus, one body, and you the kinds of ways you have of saying things, you tend to yeah. translate that way too. And so, like sometimes we'll be tra translating a line or something, and Bob will say to me, "That's an Aaron word. It's banished." You know, and it'd be like some word I use all the time. I can't think of any. Hey. <laughs> but uh, then I just like, uh, okay, okay, Bob, it's banished. You know, <laughs> and uh, then he'll translate something, and he's like, he'll be arguing for one way of saying something. I'm like, that's like such a Bob way of saying something. Like, Forget it. It's not going in the translation. <laughs> And then I let him give me an elaborate justification of why it was the greatest <laughs> line ever translated by a pubic being. And then he says, you're right. We're just <laughs> we'll just, we won't go there. But we also know in the end that if we both don't agree, then we still have to keep yeah, working we'll on just it. just leave it and yeah. keep going. But one of the things, like the, this uh, book right now, I think we have, we have a draft. It's not really ready. It's in a resting stage, and then we're both going to reread it come up with our comments, questions, things we want to change, and then we have to talk again, and then after that, Broussard can read it. But I actually, she was curious what we were up to, she, and uh, so I let her read uh, part of it. She checks on the translators. Yeah, I, I let her read part of it. She was just curious, because she wants, she enjoys working with us, so she wants to, you know, ah, oh, where, where, when do we get to see it, so I could work. And so she was reading it, and she said, oh, you know, like, she didn't really have any comments at that point, there was no point, because it's not, we're not finished. But she says, I was sitting there reading it in English, and she said, I got the same feeling as when I was writing it in French. Oh. So let me like, I thought, can't be too bad. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's a great relief uh, to, to work on, on something when you don't, you know, you, you don't have to worry about inventing it, you just have to worry about the words. Or ending it or putting it in order yeah. or yeah. getting rid of the stupid just, things in it. Or so you, you really sharpen, I think, your skills doing that.